Welcome to the Business of Property Podcast. I'm Simon. I'm Stuart. We're both property people running our own businesses. This podcast is just us chatting, as we often do about anything and everything property. As most people in property already know, there are two really important changes coming up on the 1st of October, so just a couple of days' time. So, Stuart, why don't you uh, tell everyone about one of those? I'll, I'll let you pick which one you want to go with. Well, if, if you haven't heard of the fact that the stamp duty holiday ends as of the 30th of September, I don't know where you've been in property, but I'm quite sure you will have done. So as of 1st of October, it's as you were. So just a quick reminder. So we would have always had to have paid the additional property surcharge, which um, is 3%, which we won't go into. I'm sure everyone's aware of that. But the the normal bandings now also come into effect. So that is basically you pay 0% on the stamp duty up to 125,000, 2% from 125 to 250, 5% on 250 to 925. And if you're fortunate enough to be buying over 925,000, it's 10%. And we won't even talk about the 1.5 million. I don't think we need to do that, but that's, uh, I think it's 12% on that. So all of that, comes back in from the 1st of October, which is the time of this podcast, is in a couple of days. Yep. Get ready to uh, tighten those purse strings again. Indeed. The PATMA stamp duty calculator and rental forecast system has already been updated. It's been using the new new figures for the last couple of weeks and will obviously continue to, to use the new figures in effect from the 1st of October. And with this new cliff edge, this new reduction or removal of the holiday of stamp duty, I think. In fact, I I know, I have definitely seen coming through in the data that Patma collects more property fall-throughs. So I saw a little bit of an uptick in this um, as we approached the last stamp duty holiday change. And now in the last few weeks, as we've been approaching this change, there's been even more of an uptick in the number of property fall-throughs I've been been seeing in in the data. So I think I don't know if this is going to have a real effect on asking prices or indeed sales prices, but yeah, it's definitely having disappointing effects for people who are hoping for transactions to to complete and are now not. I don't know whether that's just people realizing they're not going to make the deadline or whether there's also some down valuations happening as well where where mortgages are involved. Because I have have seen some people talking about these on on property forums and things. So so I don't know. But I, I think Although we're, we're going to be talking about news mostly today, I think you do have a, a fall through story of your own, Stuart, don't you? I'm, I'm just wiping the tears from my eyes as I am one of those statistics that for the second time on this particular property, on the second time on our studio flat, we've just had the purchase fall through. Once again, only days before exchange for exactly the same reason as happened before which I won't go into the details, but it's, it's to do with the uh, ground rent and the lease. But it's a, it's a very solvable problem, which would have costed the buyer £1,000, which they'd agreed to do, by the way, but they changed their mind. It's the second fall through I've had on that property, but the third fall through I've had this year. So I won't be going to do my lottery numbers. Well, I've never done them, but I won't be doing the lottery anytime soon. And if, you, if you're looking for luck, don't come anywhere near me this year. But it's interesting you've raised a couple of points there. I, I think what obviously the stamp duty holiday did, which is what the government was looking for, was to increase that positive sentiment around property and therefore in our day-to-day lives. And it'll be interesting to see that given that you've already noticed that uptick in fall-throughs, because just thinking from my own personal experiences, I, I can imagine that some people – suddenly if they're losing the benefit of let's say several thousand pounds you're going to call into question again your purchase and really think about it whereas at the outset it's like just things going on sale isn't it sometimes if something's half price or you know it's 25 percent off all of a sudden it feels really appealing even if you've not really thought about it and then someone says oh hold on actually it you're going to pay this price now people then call into question their rationale for for said purchase and it shouldn't be that way on property because it's such a big purchase you'd like to think that we all do it very diligently but of course we know that's not the case for for any of us really no exactly i think it's, it's a lot of it and probably more than we'd like to give credit for is all about mindset and and sentiment and exactly how people feel about things and 
if you say you can go out and buy a, a new house and, oh, look, you've got a few thousand pounds off, you think, great, that's fantastic. It's, it's cheaper, even though actually the market has more than compensated and property prices have gone up. And then, never mind that bit. But now we're at this point where the reverse is happening. And they're now saying, you can go out and buy this property. Oh, and by the way, in a couple of weeks, it's going up by a few thousand pounds and there's nothing you can do about it. And people will just think, mm, actually, and I don't like the sound of that, <laughs> even though, as you say, in the grand scheme of things, it's a percentage point here or there on what's actually being paid. But it, it's just how it feels. And you know that you're, it's costing you more. And hence, you just don't, don't like that. And I think it's just, just human nature and how people will always be. So just during this transition bit, so sort of the, the few weeks leading up to the, the change and probably a few weeks afterwards, I think that'll be playing on people's minds. But after that, people will forget and things will, will carry on again. It's interesting changing the subject a little. You mentioned that the stamp duty holiday accomplished what, what it was set out to do to f- get the market going again. But I'm not actually sure that it really did because now we've got quite a lot of data and quite a lot of history we can look back over. And if you look globally, property prices have increased over this pandemic period. In actual fact, most countries, um, at least certainly most comparable Western countries, property prices have increased more than they have in the UK. So I'm not actually sure that the stamp duty holiday really accomplished much at all, apart from perhaps playing with people's minds a bit along the way. I mean, you, you said you think it did accomplish what it set out to do. What are you basing that conclusion on? No, what I said was it created a positive sentiment around property, which I think what it did. Oh, a subtle difference. Okay, go on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I wasn't talking necessarily about the, the increase in transactions and so forth. It was more around the perception and sentiment of people around it, which is where uh, I think yeah. that's the first outcome I think they were looking for. As for the rest of it, no, I, I agree with you. I think when we look at it around the, the globe, and again, I have you know read the similar literature, it, it looks like what would have happened would have happened anyway. So we could argue, but of course, hindsight's always twenty twenty. So we don't know, but it looks like, you know, the, the property market would have increased at a fair clip, regardless of the stamp duty holiday. But yeah, no, my my point was that it, uh, around the sentiment, I think that it did provide that. Whether that then itself led to increased transactions, yeah, I think that's debatable. Yeah. So yeah, sorry, I uh, accused you incorrectly of, of that conclusion. You, I, I completely agree. In fact, that the the sentiment. It did affect and and did create positive vibes, whether they were needed and what overall effect they had. Other elements, I'm, I'm less certain, but we're, I'm absolutely completely in agreement that it did did make people think about property and and think positively about about property and and making those transactions happen sooner rather than later. Yeah, and we did say we were going to talk about two key changes, and the and the other one is the change to the eviction period. Simon, did you want to kick us off on that one? Yep. I, I'm very pleased that you left the more complicated one to me. Thank you very much, there, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> so from the 1st of October, Section 21 and some Section 8, actually, notice periods are mostly returning back to normal, as in pre-pandemic periods. So Section 21 and Section 8 for certain grounds is returning to a two-month notice period. So early on in the pandemic, it was extended to a six-month notice period. And then a couple of months ago, it was dropped down to a four-month notice period. And from the 1st of October, it's a two-month notice period again. There are still some other Section 8 grounds which have different notice periods, two weeks or a month. So if you're unsure, do check the official information. I will include a link in the show notes to um, an NRLA page, which I think gives quite a good summary of, of the new new notice periods. Interestingly, the notice periods will, or the reduction in notice periods will not be backdated. So for a, a, a chunk of September, it's actually been better to wait until the 1st of October to issue a Section 21 than it has been to, to issue it straight away, because the end date of the required notice period would be earlier. So. The other important element to this to mention before I forget is that the forms that you need to use have also changed or will also be changing on the 1st of October. 
So make sure you're using the up-to-date official statutory forms for issuing Section 21s and Section 8s, because they are changing on the 1st of October, along with the notice periods. One other thing, important thing to mention is that this is in England, probably Northern Ireland as well, but it's different in Scotland and Wales. Wales, for example, have just recently announced that they are keeping their extended notice period until, I think, December. So yeah, it's very complicated and it varies on where you are even more than it, than it used to, which is, which is a shame, but there you go. So Stuart, do you think this is going to make much difference on the ground, really, to people? having this back down to two months rather than four months for a a Section 21? In the short term, I don't think so. I think, again, I've got quite personal experience on serving notice during the pandemic, and it's a situation where if you needed to get rid of someone (laughs) for whatever reason, unlike, if, like you say, unless it's, you know, if you served it now and would have to wait four months and serve it on the 1st of October and wait two, of course, you're going to do that. Otherwise, if it were, any time before, I think people would have been taking action where necessary. But I think from the, you know, the last set of data that we looked at, that the numbers had dropped, hadn't they? As you would expect. But will there be a glut of eviction? I don't personally believe so. I think anything that would have been action would be actioned. However, again, with two months, it does make a difference to mindset once again because I do have a, a another problem tenant uh, that is upsetting other tenants and to know that we could do an s21 in two months does does make a difference because you think actually if i can solve this problem in two months rather than four six and add on the rest of the process as well then you you start thinking actually maybe we will take action so it's obviously dependent on those situations but my personal view is i I don't think there'll be an avalanche of evictions because of it no i completely agree Although if your tenant is causing trouble, sufficient trouble to be considered antisocial behaviour, you can actually give a a one-month notice period on that with a a certain Section 8 ground. So it's not something to to bear in mind. But you're right. I don't think it's going to cause people to really change their approach. No one is going to have been waiting for the notice periods to drop down again to actually suddenly take action, except perhaps just for the last few weeks while it, it really did make sense to to wait after it's been announced but before it's it's come into effect on the 1st of October but for everyone else as you say if you need to evict a tenant then you need to evict a tenant you can't hang around and and wait and if the notice period is four months or six months then you just have to get on with it and and wait for those time periods to elapse so yeah I don't I don't think we're going to see a sudden avalanche of new eviction applications and I don't think tenants either have, have anything to fear from from this sort of change causing a, a sudden problem for them. I suspect in certain areas, what the tenants may have more to fear is the, the upcoming changes in, in furlough, which is obviously being phased out completely, and reduction in universal credit um, allowances as well. So yes, I suspect that may, may cause more of an impact than the, the reduction in, in notice periods. Yeah. And on the eviction point, I think this is a good one for yourself and the listeners. Because if they can provide feedback, I'll be I'll be very interested to hear what other people would potentially think about doing. So we did serve notice on a property and the tenant did leave at the end of the six months. And we've talked about this on, on many podcasts, so I'm not going to six months ish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's not let's not go there. <laughs> and let's just say didn't leave the, the, the property in the best of conditions, decided to change locks. In fact, the lock was broken, so the front door was wide open in the flat and left some things behind. But that tenant, unsurprisingly, has moved on without a forwarding address, didn't wait for checkout and so on. So we are now in a position where we have a number of things to do. And this is very pertinent to eviction because I'm sure, and obviously I know you've been through it and lots of other people may or may not have. So it's, It's a good one to talk about. But that tenant has now moved on without a forwarding address. Aside from just leaving a lot of mess that needs this cleaning up, so so just in terms of why we would potentially pursue the tenant, because we have over four months of rent arrears, we have costs of cleaning property, which which are genuinely you know between two and three hundred pounds. We then have the cost of repairing the front door. Yeah, so we're talking about costs of 
I'm probably not going to be specific just because this is a, a public forum, but let's just say it's a good few thousand pounds. So to then start pursuing that, first thing we need to do is let the courts know, which to submit that paperwork is, I've got 355 in my head. Uh, for some reason, that's stuck in my head. But let, let's say it's about 350, 350 pounds. But of course, the first thing I need is an address. So I've spoken to previous letting agent on it. And obviously, you know, we, we've done a bit of homework, a bit of Googling, so on and so forth. It's not turning up anything. So options are hire someone to do a bit of detective work, obviously spend that time ourselves. Now, that's step one. So then we need to, to find, uncover an address. Step two, you then need to go through the court process. So you're going to go through the CCJ. Now, assuming that all went through and you did find an address, then it leads potentially towards the end of bailiffs. Now, I play this out in my head. And where this gets to is we get to someone that doesn't have anything to provide. And all we've done really is throw a few more pound notes in the burner, in the oil burner, and keep shoveling them in. So I'm interested, as we discuss this on air, so to speak, what your view would be given your experiences. But then also I'd be interested for anyone that wants to to reach out to us on the Business of Property Twitter and just get in touch with us to let us know what your views would be. Because the quandary is, do we spend more money chasing someone where the recompense is probably going to be minimal, if anything? Whereas, and, and the final point for me is just that I guess I, I do like a principle and part of me wants to make sure that the former tenant is aware of these principles and the principles being that you unfortunately you cannot behave like this in life you can't just say i'm going to up and leave i'm not going to pay i'm not going to leave you affording just so there is a lesson there to be learned so that there, there is a big part of me that wants to help this person understand that lesson but what are your thoughts about that song oh wow look what a lot to, to unpack. And can I remember all the things I thought of as you were going through it that I, <laughs> that I wanted to come back on? First of all, if you want to get in touch with us, anyone listening, our Twitter handle is Biz of Property. That's Biz with a Z. We're also on Facebook. Uh, you can search for the Business of Property podcast. You should find us there. If you go to the businessofproperty.com, you will find us there. And there's a contact form on the website as well, which will, will come through to us. If you want to reach out to Stuart and, and make any suggestions. So, what would I do? Well, actually, let let me ask you a question first. Do you think this person has any income or a job or anything? Because you you can get sort of attachment of earning type approaches rather than trying to just demand instant payment. So so do they have some income that that you could attach if you wanted? Our understanding is that this person does now have a job, but previously they were paying the rent via universal credit. Okay, so I think from, from what you've described, it's very unlikely that you would be able to actually get the money back as as a whole because they don't have that money in the bank account they don't have belongings that would likely be worth collecting in, in exchange for the, for the money so i think the only thing you could really pursue would be an attachment of earnings and assuming they're not earning very much and they may well have debts elsewhere you're probably going to be looking at a few tens of pounds a month so if you've got a debt of thousands of pounds let's pick £2,000. I, I have no idea what your actual figure is, so I'm just going to make that up for the point of argument. If you could get an attachment of earnings of, say, £20 a month, that's going to take a long time for you to, to be able to be paid back what, what you're owed. And, and given that, I don't think there's any point really in pursuing it if your sort of real objective is actually recouping the money. You're, it's, it's just not going to happen in a feasibly quick or useful time span and that's assuming you get it at all you might spend 300 pounds on on a court another few hundred pounds on a private detective a few more pounds on getting someone to to help put together the paperwork and things a few days of your time to do that and to attend a court case and you might actually win or not win but end up getting nothing out of it at all and you've just spent even more money so yeah definitely don't do it if you wanted to try and achieve the money it would be my my suggestion so then the question is do you think it's worth going through that effort and that extra expense which from the figures i've just said might be an extra thousand pounds in order to stick to the principle of of what 
should be paid when you agree. You go into a contract, you agree you, you're going to pay some money, look after property, live there, etc. Is it worth it to you to pursue that principle for that extra cost and effort? What do you think, Stuart? And that's the $64 million question, isn't it? For me, it's definitely not about the money. It's, you know, given that I've tried to, you know, play this through. And, and like you say, if you're getting 20 pounds a month or whatever, like, you know, 200, let's say 240 pounds a year, you're talking about you know five years before you see anything close to, you know, the money. So it's not for me about money. It's about should the person be taught that lesson and, and should that person be me to teach it? Given all of the things that you just talked about, the time, the effort, you know, as as we all are, we're very busy. You know, we have jobs or families and you know, lives to live. So, you know, do I have the, the time of the inclination? And that's the question. That's why I'd be interested to hear from our listeners as well about anything on that. So please do go to those links that Simon has mentioned and drop us just a quick note about we're just saying yes, go for it. Don't know, don't be so stupid or see whatever you think the third option could be so i'd be very very interested to hear that yep i'd be very interested to hear what our listeners have to suggest as well so i think we shall leave it there this week please do look at the show notes at the business of property.com there will be links to ways you can reach out and, and contact Stuart and, and us generally other than that please do leave us a rating and review in whatever podcast player or application you use. We really do appreciate them. And Stuart and I will talk to you again next week.